y'all here. Glory to God. Are you going to put me on here? Or? Okay. Oh, I'm on. Hallelujah. Good to have you on today. Um, I'm just going to make some announcements. We've got a lot of awesome things coming up. And uh, if you were here earlier, you would have heard us. We're, we're speaking to nations. We're, we're going to nations. It's awesome to see um, in different seasons of your life what God does. And he works with you in the present, amen. But as we get ready to roll over into the new year in the Jew on the Jewish calendar, which is Monday, which is the Jewish New Year, and actually Pastor Kevin and my anniversary is on the on the 26th as well. So we're celebrating 30 years, and um, so excited about the new season. And I said last last Monday or last Sunday to everything it says in Ecclesiastes, there is a season and a purpose for everything under heaven. And sometimes even we can see into the future and see something as if it's going to happen today. But sometimes those things are for an appointed time. And so even though the Bible says that even though you see a vision, it has an appointed time. And we can't force and we can't push the season ahead of its time, right? We can't make it be in in a spring be fall because there is a season in the earth and likewise there are seasons in the kingdom of God and so last year it was really interesting when the Lord's put uh, past uh, sister uh, sister pastor <laughs> Irene into our lives and opened doors for us um, into some nations uh, into different nations and we are excited about the opportunity that God has provided for us and so I wanted to just kind of tell you some of the things that we have coming up because October is going to be a great, an awesome time for us. We began our ministry in October, the first meeting that we ever had. We didn't know we were going to have a church. We didn't know God was calling us to have a church. But we began this ministry in October, so that's kind of a, a beginning for us. Amen. And so um, tomorrow morning we'll be having our prayer saturation. For those of you that are aware of that, we have we start at five in the morning and the and the prayer line. Um, I'll give you just a minute. We start at five in the morning. Most of it is on conference, but at ten o'clock from ten till twelve, we pray for people that need sick. You need to be prayed for uh, healing. But you can text me on my my telephone. If you have me to pray for you over uh, some type of health issue, a lot of people have been sick. Um, as we watch what um, we've been teaching on, I've been teaching a, a lot on healing. I have a lot of, uh, of teachings on healing on YouTube, and a lot of people have been taking them because I we pray for a lot of people that are sick in their body, and so. Um, so tomorrow morning, we're going to have our monthly prayer saturation. You can join in with us. You can be in for 15 minutes if you want to. You, and I'm going to give you the prayer line to call in. You don't have to stay on uh, all the time. You can pop in. You can pop off. And, and uh, you'll hear people praying. Sometimes you'll hear people speaking. Um, if you want, if you have something that you'd like to, for us to pray about on that prayer line, you just let us know and you can speak on, on the prayer line. And that number is 240-591-0248. And that, then you dial, ex, or you press extension 671072. I'm going to give that to you again. 240-591-0248. And then extension 671072. If you can't, for some reason, get in that conference line, you can call me direct and I'll patch you in because some carriers don't go into that, can't take get, get that conference line. So you can call me directly. And then um, we're going to be in October 7th and 8th, we're going to have our first Revive Faith Miami in Miami. And uh, we're launching um, our new partnership that we have is Kevin, G Kevin KGHM Ministries. So we're going to be giving out partner uh, brochures at that event. But we're real excited because when we were in Miami last year, the Lord spoke to Kevin that he has a field there. So um, uh, the Lord has brought Irene into our life and, and, and introduced us to some other pastors. So we're going to have, it's going to be bilingual. 
And so we're going to be ministered, ministering there October 7th and 8th. It's a Friday night and a Saturday. So if you're near Miami or Fort Lauderdale, you can reach out to us and we'd love to have you. It's going to be in English and Spanish. And we're just real excited about what the Lord's going to do in Miami uh, with us this, this month. Also, October uh, 14th, we're going to have our youth event, with it, which is Arise. It's going to be on a Friday night, and we're going to have, uh, it's 12 and up, so it's going to be really uh, different than ever. Every year it's different, but this year we're going to have the men and uh, the young men and the young women together, and we're excited, uh, Brother uh, Kate, Brother Michael and Sister Katie and Sister Hannah are going to be heading it up. And we've got a lot of interesting things coming together for that. That's going to be here. And uh, we're going to start at 6 o'clock. It's going to go to 11 because we pack a lot in and we have a lot of fun. So uh, we invite you, if you have any youth that you'd like to bring, we're going to have, have that on October 14th. And then we're going to head to Maine the 20th of October. And... Um, so that's going to be a fun time. We, I have never been to Maine, but we're going to be going up, up there. And, and Pastor Kevin have been, and I have been invited to speak up in, in Maine over that weekend. And so we've got some awesome things. We've got some things coming for November, but that's enough for you for October. And uh, again, I'm just so grateful to that we, we went last night and, and had dinner last night at the place. Pastor, come on up. It's your turn to come. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, we got to, uh, praise the Lord. We went to the restaurant where we first kind of knew that things were changing in our relationship. So we went back there last night. And one of the waiters that used to wait on us all the time was still there. And he, he said, didn't I wait on you all those years ago? I said, yeah. And, and so we had just a wonderful time last night. And and we have so many exciting things ahead, and uh, we're so grateful for this new season that the Lord's opening doors for us to go different places. That doesn't mean we're, we're leaving you all here. We're still here, and you can come. There will be somebody here every Sunday and every Wednesday, And uh, but we are so, so grateful for what he has done. It's been 30, 30 years of heaven, hallelujah, <laughs> and it's just getting better, and uh, so we thank you for being with us today, and the, those that are here in attendance today, God bless. Hallelujah, thank you, God, thank you, precious. Well, welcome, God bless you, we're here at the end of September, and as, as uh, Mom said, you know, it's always, it's the close of, uh, it's the close of uh, the Jewish year, and uh, not that that makes much difference to us, but <laughs> but it, it is what season. it is. It is what it is. It's, I mean, a, it's season. a season. And uh, for me, I, you know, my business is over the years, they were always quiet in the summer. And uh, so you long about September, you know, this time they would begin to pick up again. And then it would be busy through till the ne end of the, the next uh, summer. So, uh, so it was always a great time. It was always a, a time of change. And uh, so I was very, very thankful for the time of, uh, time of change. The first thing, here's the first thing we're going to do today. We're going to pray over this storm that's coming. Right. And uh, we were given dominion and authority over the created order. And the problem with most men, most, most Christians, is we don't know what we have authority over and what we don't have authority over. We have been given in Genesis 126, uh, God said, let us create man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over. And he began, what he really described after that was he described the created order. So Adam was intended to be the God of the earth. You and I were intended to be the gods of the earth. Easy. God with a little G, you know, we, we, we submit ourselves to the big G, yes. to a big God, but we're supposed to be the little gods. We're supposed to be the gods of the created order. We're supposed to rule and reign here, and eventually we'll rule and reign there with him. So uh, one of the items that we unquestionably have authority over is the area to which God has assigned us. And uh, whatever you're at, for example, if you live in Spring Hill, you know, or wherever it is that you happen to live, um, you know, we have uh, authority, we've been given authority over uh, Bureau Beach and authority over the Tampa Bay area. And uh, likewise, I suspect we're going to end up with some authority over Miami as well. But we, we uh, uh, you know, I'm not 
too, I'm not completely clear on that. But we take authority over these storms. So let's just do that now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we curse this storm. We command it to dissipate. We command it to just vanish and to go away. You can go wherever you're going to go, but you're not going to bring your destructive power here. Yes. And we thank you in Jesus' name. We thank you that we have authority over that storm. We take authority over that yes. storm, and we command it to shrivel up, to, to take its destructive power, and to go somewhere else, yes. do something else with it. And we just thank you for that. We thank you for your covenant of protection. We yes. thank you for Psalm 91. And Father, we are a Psalm 91 people. And we take authority over this thing. But we take authority over every demonic situation that comes against our property, our household, our families, our lives, or any of those things. We take authority over those things. You gave it to us. And we thank you. And we rely on you. We, we, you know, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, he's my fortress, he's my God. In whom will I trust? And so, Father, we trust in you. You are our protector. You are our shield. And we think that we curse that thing in Jesus' name. You know, we've been, uh, I have been born again for, you know, well over 30 years. And in that 30-year time, frame, there's never been a hurricane that's come to Tampa that's, a, that's brought a destructive force. We've had them come up the state and just dissipate when they got here. We've had them turn and go out to sea. We've had all sorts of different things happen, but there's never been one that has come and brought a destructive force. And it will not start this year. Hallelujah. And it Thank skipped you, over Odessa. Remember that? Yeah, we had, we've had it skip over skip Odessa. Over we've had it, Odessa. We, we had it one year. One of them came up the center of the state, and the storm parted yes. and went this way and that way and completely missed Tampa and kept on going. So yeah. it doesn't really matter to us exactly how it, 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 it happens, you know and how it goes forward. We just know that we have been given authority over it, that it will not come to our area. And uh, similarly with Vero Beach, you know, we there were there were a, a number of years ago, there were a number of uh, uh, storms that came to Vero Beach and just destroyed Vero Beach. And, uh, but since we, uh, since we went there almost 20 years ago, there's never been a destructive storm come again to Vero Beach, nor will there be while we have authority over that place. So I just encourage you, you know, release your faith. Use your faith. Use your mouth. Use the authority that God gave you to take dominion and authority over what belongs to you. Oh, uh, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. I thank you for your covenant of protection. Oh, uh, hallelujah. Well, Lord, we bless you and we praise you. We, we've had the most remarkable things happen. We were in, uh, we were one night, Hurricane Sandy, which I don't know if y'all remember the name, Hurricane Sandy, it was an incredibly destructive storm that brought the majority of its power up north. And uh, like in New York City, for example, it flooded all the subways and uh, it just brought incredible destruction all up the northern east coast there. And uh, But it's originated, of course, like they all do, uh, down in uh, off the coast of Africa. And so it came, and it came ashore in Vero Beach. And uh, we were there the night that it came ashore. And uh, I was asleep. Gail was taking authority over the storm. And the storm ended up coming ashore. And uh, she took authority over it. Well, the sto storm actually came ashore about 100 yards north of our house. And uh, you could actually see, on the, at the time we lived on the beach, you could actually see in the seawall where the storm had actually begun to come ashore from there. But there was no destruction. There was no, there was no destruction in Vero Beach. No destruction actually occurred until it got further up, up north, but it still came. So anything can happen, and it probably will, but there isn't going to be a destructive force that will come to here. Hallelujah. So, Father, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, we just bless you. The truth is, people don't take the authority that belongs to them. One of two things happens. Either we don't know what belongs to us, or we don't use or take what belongs to us. And if we don't know what belongs to us, we're ignorant. And it's our responsibility to find out. And Because uh, it's not an excuse to say, well, gee, I just didn't know. You know, it's not an acceptable excuse. Because we ought to be finding out. That's where we're supposed to study to show ourselves as an approved workman. That's what the Bible said. And uh, meaning we should know what belongs to us. We should know what power we have, what things we're able to do. So, so. 
Anyway, well, praise the Lord. Well, as Gil mentioned, <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to uh, Miami here, and so I thought I'd kind of do a little warm-up of what things we're going to be uh, talking about, because they're, 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 um, they're good things. Amen. And um, when, when you got born again, what happened? And you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Everything changed from a spiritual perspective, not from a physical perspective, but from a spiritual perspective. What happened is the sin nature that you possessed, you gave that over. Jesus took that from you and he gave to you the, righteous, the, the gift of righteousness. And you became at that moment, you became the righteousness of God in Christ. And uh, you, you might not have noticed, it might not have seen anything any different, might not have even felt any different, but that's what happened. You became the righteousness of, of God in Christ. You became subject to an entirely different set of laws that you had been subject to before. All of a sudden, you became subject to God's law. And uh, you were subject to it before, but in a very different manner. But when you got born again, what you said, whether you knew you said it or not, what you said was, I submit myself to you. I submit myself to your law. I submit myself to your word. And uh, when you were born again, that's what you said. Now, you, you may not have even known that you said that, but that's a reality of what happened. You became subject to, let, let's call it spiritual law. We were always subject to spiritual law, but you came subject to spiritual law in a very different manner. What happened is what you really said, and you might, and once again, you might not have known you said it, what you, might, what you said was, God, I, I, I'm willing to submit myself to your law. I want to learn about your law, and I'm going to learn how to operate your, under your law, and, and, and that's my new life. I, I have a new life in Christ. And that's what happened, whether you knew it or not. And so you became subject to an entirely different set of laws, and, and God is a, a, a gracious and loving Father. He, he is generous. He's forbearing. He's uh, uh, not difficult to get along with, but he is God. And, uh, and he is in charge. And he's <laughs> always right. He's never wrong. He's always right. And he's, he's always in charge. And so um, he, sometimes he'll, he'll, he'll with, with every new believer, what happens is he will cut you some slack in the beginning because you just didn't know. But you can't continue the defense of, well, I just didn't know, you know. What happens is you're, 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 once again, the Bible instructs us to study to show ourselves as an approved workman so that we would become subject to that law and we would begin to understand the, the different spiritual laws and so forth. Now, the Bible calls, the, the Bible is called the law of God. And uh, in uh, uh, John chapter 1, the, the, uh, uh, it says that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. And the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, speaking of Jesus. Well, Jesus was every bit of God. Jesus was fully, fully God. So when it says that the word was with God, the word was God, that meaning that God and his word are one. God and his word are, are one creation, one created thing. And so to, to read it in his word or to see it in his word or to hear it spoken in his word is, is all the same as if you were in his presence and he spoke to you directly. It's all the same. It's, he, he and his word are, uh, are one. That is called the law of God. And uh, particularly the Old Testament. And so but they called it the law of God. And uh, this is the written down law of God. But it's not a static thing. It's not just a book. It's not just words on a page. It's a spirit. And uh, because God is a spirit. And so if God and his word are one, that means the word is a spirit as well. So what we want to do is we want to be renewed or we want to understand in our spirit. We want to understand the spiritual side of the law of God. Now in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4, he calls the law of God exceeding great and precious promises that you would be a partaker of the divine nature. So what is called alternatively the law of God is also called alternatively the exceeding great and precious promises that you'd be a partaker of the divine nature. They're exactly the same thing. The question is, how did you see it? See, if you saw, if you saw the word as a, a set of restrictive uh, 
commitments and obligations that you had to abide by and they were undesirable and they were punishment and they were whatever you saw as a negative thing, uh, then you saw it as, as probably the law of God and an un, un, per, per, perhaps an unjust thing. On the other hand, if you saw God for who he really was and you saw God for the outworking of who he really was and the things that he did, you begin to see the promises. And see, the reality is it is the law of God, but the objective of the law was to benefit you. The objective of the law was to make you a partaker of the divine nature. Now, the divine nature is never sick. It's never broke. It's never in a desperate need or desperate lack of any kind. Um, the divine nature of God has at its disposal all the things that it requires to lead a successful life. So that's what the Bible was supposed to be for you. It was supposed to be a series of laws and rules and promises that meant that if you studied those and you obeyed those what would happen is that you would become more like christ you become more christ-like and and god's desire with every human being is that christ be formed in you that's what the apostle paul said he, he discovered toward the end of his life one of the things he discovered was his calling him as assignment from god the most important thing that he was to teach and to preach was Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so if it was important for him who wrote most of the New Testament, it's just as important for you and I. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And uh, it's, it, it bears remembering because it becomes sometimes the deciding line and it becomes the thing that you can use to distinguish what you're supposed to do, where you're supposed to go, the things that you're, you're uh, supposed to do. Now, so spiritual law, you became subject to spiritual law. And again, this is spiritual law. And in Ephesians 4.23, um, we're told, be ye renewed in the spirit of your mind. In other words, meaning that your mind was to, to be renewed to the law and purposes of God. Now, if, and, and, and so if you've never been born again, how, how could you be renewed to the law? Well, the reason you're renewed to the law is because you were in, you existed in the mind of God in eternity past. In heaven, before you ever came to the earth, you existed. And the law of God existed within you. And you were, you had, a, you had the mind of Christ when you were in eternity past. When you came into this realm, your mind was basically wiped or was, 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 was cleansed. And you needed to begin again with renewing your mind to, or, or, or bringing, making your mind new again to what existed when you were in heaven. That's why it's so critical to read the Word. That's why it's so critical to study the Word. Most Christians don't really read the Word. They don't really study the Word. And they don't understand that that's how you get the promise. See, the Word and the promise are the same thing. I want all the promises that God had for me. I mean, He made... You know, he, 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 uh, Psalm 107, 20 is a good example. He sent his word and he healed me and delivered me from all destruction. I want that promise. I want him to be able to send his word. Anytime I get sick, I want him to send that, that word to me. I want that, that promise. So I need to know what it is and I need to know that it belongs to me in order to actually take it. So that's part of the reason why it's so, uh, so, so critical to, uh, to read the word, to study the word, because if you don't know what the promise is, you don't know what belongs to me. You know, if you had a, a relative who died and uh, they left you some money in the bank and you didn't know that it was there, you, you, you'd never go get it. You know, you wouldn't, you, you just wouldn't know. And so there's, and that's how it is with the promises of God. Most Christians don't know what the promises are, what are the promises that belong to them. And it's critical that you would know that if you're ever going to possess that thing. Now, listen, well, you just, if, you, if you use the example of a relative who died and they had some money that was set aside in your, your, your account or your, your name so that you were able to take possession of that, and uh, you didn't know it, you are never going to be able to take possession of it. Right. But let's suppose that you do know. And... Uh, the, this relative passes away, and you know that there's money there. You just got to go get it. The bank has a protocol for you to receive that money. 
you can't just walk into the bank and say, well, you know, I, this is money in my name, I'd like to have it. You know, you're not gonna get it. It doesn't work that way. There's a protocol for how you, you get it. They're gonna ask you to identify yourself. They're gonna ask you to somehow identify that that's your money, that that belongs to you. They're, and, and they're gonna ask you for your social security number and your driver's license and how did you get on the account. And there's a, there's a series of protocol questions that you're gonna to have to answer in order to get that money. It is exactly the same way with the Bible. There's a protocol, God has a protocol. And uh, it, God wants you to have his promises all. Like, let, let, let's go back to the, the, the illustration of the, 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 the relative who dies. They put the money in your account because they wanted you to have it. But you have to follow the appropriate protocol in order to be able to get it. Spiritual law works exactly like that. There's a protocol. And when you know and understand the protocol, then you know how to get your promises. But if you don't know and understand the protocol, they're yours. They belong to you. They've been laid up in your name, but you can't get them because you, you don't even know what they are, let alone how to get them. That's why it's so incumbent on us to study the Word, to know what, what, what was it that God had for us, you know? He has so much. He's such a good God. He's a generous and a loving God. And He has all these things laid up for us that He wants you to possess. But you got to do it His way. That's the thing. That's the, the, the protocol of doing it uh, His way. And uh, to, so, so let's kind of start at the beginning there. So if we start at the beginning, so what, what are the essentials? Well, the first essential is to believe His Word. You know, you've got to believe His Word. Um, and Romans 10, 9, and 10 says that the way you got saved or the way you got born again was you believed in your heart and you confessed with your mouth that Jesus was Lord. When you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you should be saved. That pattern, that process of believing yes. and speaking, everything in the Word of God, everything you ever receive from God yes. follows that pattern. Yes. That's the pattern, to believe it and to speak it. Now, Amen. there's a place of believing the Word. What I recommend people do, and it's difficult for people to do, I appreciate that, you just decide, I believe every word that's in there. Yes. Every single word that's in there, I believe it. Right. That's the, I mean, it's set, and I believe it. Now, the, the, sometimes that requires some, some uh, meditation. Sometimes it requires some thinking. Sometimes it requires to, 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 to work on it a little bit. Because the battleground is the mind. Remember what we just said in Ephesians 4.23 said, be ye renewed in the spirit of your mind. The devil's battleground with you is in your mind. Yes. And that's the place he's coming. He, what he wants, number one, he wants you to not believe it. You know, don't believe what God has for you. Don't believe the word. If the word says he's a deliverer, don't, don't believe that. If the word says he's a healer, don't believe that. You know, you, you, or, or you question it. You're, you're not absolutely sure. And so the entire process of receiving anything from God, the entire process of receiving what God has for you, it begins with believing the word. And it's just a choice. You must make the choice. I just, I believe the word. Now, once again, you believe in your mouth, or believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. So there's something about this confession business that goes with it. In other words, it's not just believing, but there's a confession as well. Now, there's something about the way the human being was made, and he was constructed by God, something about the, the, the way the human being was constructed by God, that there's something about the speaking and the hearing that cements the believing. In other words, the more you hear it, the more you believe it. And you can speak to yourself, you can speak the word, that's why it's so critical. Read the word out loud. You should be, when you're reading the word, don't just read it to yourself. Read it out loud because you want your ears to hear it. There's something about the processing. Now, everybody, we have two ears. We have the natural ear and we have the spiritual ear. And you can hear it with your spiritual ear, but you need to hear it with both ears. You need to hear your natural ear as well as you need to hear it with uh, uh, your, 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 your spiritual ear. So it's not enough just to read it silently. You should occasionally read it out loud. And so that your ears hear it, 
and your your processor, if you will, begins to process it. It hears it and it begins to process it and it begins to cement. There's a circle, there's a cycle. So you speak the word, you hear the word, the word goes in and begins to be cemented. The more you speak it, the more you hear it, the more cemented it gets in there. And it helps you to believe it. But to believe, the most important thing about believing, and this is the key, and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll regress for just a moment. When God created man, when, when God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, the one thing he gave man that he did not give any other portion of the created order was he gave man the right to decide, man the right to make a decision. So you can decide whether you're going to serve Jesus or not. The rest of the created order doesn't have the right to make that decision. Nothing in the created order has that right to decide, only man. And it's what made man the Lord over the rest of creation. It's what distinguished man from the rest of the created order. And it set him just a little bit lower than God, or set him just a little. The Bible says he, thou has created him a little bit lower than Elohim. Elohim means the most high God. So man was created just a little bit lower than the most high God. But he was created by decision to make a decision to serve him. Make a decision to believe. So the most important thing, if you're going to believe God, if you're going to believe God, the most important thing is to, is, is to make a decision that you believe. That's why it's, what you want to do is you want to say, God, I believe your word. I just, I believe your word. I believe every word that's in there. I believe everything you said. I believe every, every word that is in that Bible. I believe it. And what happens is that belief, belief is like a seed. And uh, it is a seed. Belief is a seed. And uh, you, when you made a choice to believe, you planted the seed. The more you meditated it, the more you thought about it, you watered the seed. You, the seed got a fertilizer. It began to grow up and it began to, to mature. And that's what you wanted. You wanted the, that seed uh, to mature. The place where you want your believer to go is the place where you are fully persuaded. Now that's in Romans chapter 4. I'm in the interest of time, I want to turn that. But Romans chapter 4 talks about that's what distinguished Abraham from the rest of the other people on earth at that time. Yes. Was that he was fully persuaded that what God said he was going to do, he was going to do. Amen. He was, he was able to do it and he was going to do it. He was fully persuaded. Another way of saying it was that his belief had come full circle. In other words, his belief had matured. His belief had grown. And all of a sudden, what happened was, it wasn't belief anymore. It became knowledge. And there's a high, the highest expression of your ability to trust God is not to believe God. It's to know. And you can meditate and you can decide that you believed or not that you can come to the place where you know. And when you know, you're at a higher place because what you believe can be changed. I mean, we've all believed things that were wrong. We've all believed, you know, I, I used to believe this and I, I, I realized that was not right. You know, I believed that and I came to understand I was mistaken because I could change what I believe. But what you know, you can't change. And where, what, you, what you're responsible for is if you're ever going to come to the place where those promises are a reality to you and you're going to be able to take possession of the promises, you must come to the place where you don't believe them anymore. You know them. You, you know what they are and you know they're going to work. And you know who God is that he's able to, to do those things. So to believe. Now the second part of that is to speak. And uh, these th those two principles underlie what we call the concept of faith. And uh, Hebrews 11.6 says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. For we must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So faith is a, is a, a critical element. It's the only thing that the Bible says pleases God. So if you were interested in pleasing God, you'd want to build your faith. You'd want to see your faith grow because that's how you please God. Moreover, it's how the promises become a reality. They all require faith. 
Faith is like, uh, faith is a glue that binds you to the promise of God. And in other words, I use my faith. I, I, I see there's a promise in there. I want to bind myself to that promise so that that promise belongs to me. I need some element to bind me to it. It's like a glue. Faith is the glue. Faith is, binds me to the promise. Another way of saying it is faith is a nail, like, for example. And uh, 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 that might even be a better example. You're going you're to put two boards together. You need a nail to hold the two boards together. Well, if I'm going to bind me to something, I need a nail. Faith is the nail. And confession or speaking the promises of God is the hammer that hammers in the nail. That's a key, that's, that's a key thing. The, uh, uh, the principle is it's not enough to just know there's a promise. You have to believe the promise. And you have to believe that it's for you and that it will work for you. And that if God said, you know, he bore your sicknesses and carried your diseases and by his stripes ye were healed, then that's what it means. Then that's what really happened. That's, that's to, to believe that, to come to the place where you've accepted that that is the truth of the matter. Now, you bind yourself to the promise, or you, 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 you use faith to bind you to the promise. There's a promise there. I believe it. I chose to believe it. It's my promise, because I believe it. It's not, it's, it's not and, and that's one of the things we talk about, you know, uh, and, and, and I'll I, it just digress just for a moment. We, we talk about the time. See, I'm not interested really in what you think the tithe is or isn't, or whether you think it's New Testament or whether you think it's Old Testament or whatever. I have a promise from God on that, in that area. I'm bound to God by my faith in that area, and it's been hammered home by the, the hammer of confession so many times that it's not a covenant, it's not old covenant, it's not new covenant, it's not a covenant between somebody else. This is my covenant with God. See, God at the end of the day, he's the same guy. He, your God is the same God as mine, but he doesn't treat you the same way as he treats me. He treats everybody different. God treats every person differently according to how that person responds to them. So I might get promises answered that you don't. You might get promises answered that I don't, because God treats everybody differently depending upon you know how did you receive that promise? What did what, what what did you do? So once again, the the process then is whatever this promise is, whatever I'm going to believe God for, I gotta that's got to be my promise. It needs to be bound to me, and faith is what binds the promise to me. Faith is the nail that binds me. To the promise and the speaking or the confession is the hammer that hammers in the nail in other words you take two boards together you put a nail there and, and if, but if it's not hammered in it isn't going to do any good they won't be you know, you'll have the two pieces of board and you'll have the nail but it won't be hammered in confession is what hammers the nail in it's what hammers faith in to make confession of it the more you repeat it the more it takes. So, so where we are so far then is, is uh, uh, the process, if you will. It's, it's also called the law of receiving. Uh, the law of receiving meaning that's how I receive. I believe in my heart, I confess with my mouth, and I receive. I receive the promise, I begin to receive the promise. So, you, so let's call that the law of, of receiving. Now, what is faith? What is this business of faith? You know, so we, we know faith is is uh, faith is important, and faith is the substance that binds the, the the promises together. And in fact, Hebrews chapter eleven one says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So in other words, faith is, is, is there, there, there's something to this faith business. And uh, if I'm believing for a promise and I know what it is and I'm, I wanna be bound to that promise, my faith is the substance of the promise. In other words, that's the way I took possession of the promise. I didn't take possession of the promise 
when I took possession of it. I took possession of it when I got faith for it and my faith began to, to uh, uh, take place. So now the Bible says, and this is Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's where faith comes from. That's how you, how you, you, uh, uh, how you get faith is it comes from the word. It comes from hearing and it comes from hearing the word. So the more you hear it, the more the word is going to be, be uh, 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 built up in you. So faith comes by hearing. Now, you don't always hear all the things you want to believe. You don't always hear all the promises of God. In other words, there's, there's a lot of promises that aren't really taught in the church. That doesn't mean they don't belong to you. They're just not taught. And because they're not taught, you didn't hear them. You didn't hear them unless you began to study. So the Bible says, and, and this is what, what happened, was the disciples spoke to Jesus, and the disciples asked Jesus, and this is Luke chapter 17, verse 5, the disciples said to Jesus, increase our faith. We need more faith. See, they were watching Jesus do things that uh, men couldn't do. They were watching miraculous things happen, and they realized it was his faith that was producing. So what they said to Jesus was, they said, increase our faith. And Luke chapter 17, verse 5, let's just, we'll turn there for a minute. Luke 17, 5. Uh, Luke 17, 5. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Let me read that again. If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you would say to the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, be planted in the sea, and should obey you. He's describing the process of sowing and reaping. He's describing seed time and harvest. And what he's saying is if you want your faith to grow, that's how it's going to grow. What he said to the disciples was, I can't do that for you. You have to do it yourself. And the way you do it is you plant it and you reap it. You plant, you sow it, and you reap it. And the way you sow in the realm of the Spirit is to speak it, is to say it. Mm -hmm. Every time you say it, you're planting a seed. Every time you hear it and it comes back in the form of a decision that you're going to agree, that's how you receive. That's how, you, you, that's how it, it gets built up. That's how you increase your faith over those things. Mm -hmm. So to be able to speak it, to be able to say it, is sowing it, is sowing your faith. And then to hear it, to receive it, is reaping your faith, or, or, or how you reap it. So those are the two areas of faith. Basically, that's how faith grows. So if you're not able to produce what the Word of God says you should be able to produce because of a lack of faith, that's how you get the faith. That's how you make the faith grow. Faith comes by hearing, and you plant it, and you hear it. Plant it, and you just keep on planting it, and you just, you know, we're in the real estate business, and when we see a piece of property that we want, or when we we decide that there's a piece of property that we're going to move on, the first step, right. always the first step, is to speak to that property and to call that property in, and just say, you know, I call you in in the name of Jesus. You belong to me. I take possession of you. You are mine in the the, the realm of the spirit. And, um, um, you know, it, sound, it sounds a bit ludicrous, but you're engaging spiritual law. What you're doing, in, 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 and let's say that you, want, you need a car, and you don't have the money for a car. You speak to the car. You find out what you want. You begin to speak to the car. You know, you call it in. You say, you know, I, you know, I call you in in the name of Jesus. Or you want a house. You want to buy a house. You find the house you want to buy, and you speak to the house. Because that's how it works in the realm of the spirit. It's different than the realm of the natural. In the realm of the natural, you know, you go check the, the listing, you know, and you find out how much it is and you see if you can qualify for the financing or whether it is to the spirit realm is entirely different. In the spirit realm, it begins with you speaking. It begins with you calling it in. It begins with you taking possession of it. Now, 
once again, we've been doing this for a long time. We're in the real estate business. What will happen is, if it is not my property, uh, I'll generally hear immediately, or within very, a very short order, no, that's not yours, that's not what I have for you. I, I don't have that for you. Keep on looking, keep on, on moving. And uh, it saves you a lot of time. You, know, you don't have to keep looking at stuff that, that God says that's not yours. And uh, uh, so that process of speaking and hearing and speaking and hearing, and again, you hear that with your spirit here. It's not a, a natural thing. But to be able to hear from God, this is not what I have for you, that's a very encouraging thing, you know, because it means there's something he does have for you, and that's not it. So you're looking, you're just, you know, you, you just haven't found it yet. But God has something for you. And, and once again, he'll, he'll speak to you. He'll, he'll lead you in that. We've had it happen where I've heard the Holy Spirit say, okay, let's go. This is yours. Let's get, let's get going, you know. And in the absence of any, any uh, uh, evidence to the contrary, we just get going. And uh, we get going in the realm of the Spirit. And we get going, calling that thing in. Once again, that process, you speak it and you believe it. You speak it, you hear it, you believe it. You speak it, you hear it, believe it. It works the same way, whatever you're calling. Maybe you're calling in a new house. Maybe you're calling in a new car. Maybe you're calling in a new business or a, a, a contract or something like that, you know. Uh, it, all, it all works the same way. It's exactly the same process, you know. You, you begin to... To, to speak to it over the realm of the spirit. And invariably, then what happens is it begins to play out in the, the realm of the spirit. So that's a, that's a, good, uh, that's a good example of how, how you go forward. So what the Bible says is that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But the key is, hey, that's, a, that's what faith is the substance of, but what is the substance of faith? How do you build your faith? How do you make your, your, your faith work? Well, I'll tell you this, and you won't, and, and it'd be difficult to, you, you know, you have to read between the lines to get to this. The substance of faith is the love and trust of God. That's what makes you, that's what makes faith begin to grow. Because faith, you know, like for, for example, if, if, let's say, the, you know, Nokia and I, we've been married for 30 years. I trust her implicitly. 30 years ago, I didn't know that. You know, I mean, 30 years ago, I didn't, I thought I could, I thought, you know, that I would be able to trust her, but I didn't know, and same with her, with me, she thought she could trust me, but she didn't really know, you know, and we've all met people that were, were uh, uh, deceivers, you know, that you thought you could trust them, and you, you, you realized you couldn't, but uh, what happened is, as you love them, and as you trust them, as you spend more time with them, the better you get to know them, the more you realize, I can trust them. I can trust that person. That's how it works with God. See, can you trust God to deliver what you want, what, what his promise said that he was going to deliver? The more time you spend with him, the more love you put on him, the better you're going to be able to trust him. And the more time you spend with him, it grows, it graduates. It graduates by the process of seed time and harvest. You sow your love, you reap love. But in reaping love, you reap faith. Similarly with sowing trust, you know, God, I trust you. God, I trust you in this matter. I trust you in this situation. And what happens is you begin to reap trust and you begin to reap faith. And that, that's how you begin to build your faith. Because you get to know God, and you get to know who He is, and you get to know what He's doing, and you get to know how He operates, and all of a sudden, you begin to trust Him. And as you begin to love Him, as you begin to trust Him, your faith begins to grow. And as faith begins to grow, there is nothing that faith will not produce. There is nothing that faith will not produce. There is nothing that faith will not produce. That's a, that's a, it's a key thing. You ought to say that to yourself. You ought to hammer that home. There's nothing that faith will not produce because it's true. There is nothing that faith will not produce. So that's the deal on faith, and you, you, you use your faith. Well, that whole process, that's how it works on using faith for anything. You find the promise. If there's a promise of God in there, I want the promise. If the promise was that he's going to send his word and heal me, 
then I want that promise. That's what I want. So I begin to speak it. I begin to say it. I begin to ask God, what do I sow? You know, is there something that I need to sow? Because the next step really is sowing, is, is beginning to sow what? And in the church, what ha what's happened in the church is, 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 by and large, the church has misled people in the arena of sowing and reaping. And uh, they've l l led their people to believe that it's mostly about money. And it is not mostly about money. It's mostly about the love and trust of God. That's, that's what it's mostly about. Now, if you love God and you trust God, you're willing to give God your money. I mean, you're willing to sow whatever God says to sow because you love God and, and, and you trust God. You're willing to do whatever it, it, it is that he said. But what you're really sowing is love and trust. You're not really sowing money. And in the church, what's happened is we've conditioned people to believe that, oh, you can sow your money for, for anything, and it isn't so. It's just not so. You can sow your love and your trust for anything, and uh, God may speak to you about money, or he may speak to you about some tangible something, or, or, or sowing something to receive something back. He may very well speak to you about those things. But what you're really sowing at the root and the core is the love and trust of God. The relationship, if you will. That's it. What, what, what God is after with every one of us is relationship. He wants us, He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants every human being to have a relationship with Him. And when you sow the word, when you sow your belief, when you sow your time into Him, you're, what you're saying to Him is, I want a relationship with you. That's what he's responding to. What he responds to more than anything else is you saying to him, I want a relationship with you. I want, you know, whether it's a, not just monetary thing, not just a tangible thing, not just a healing thing. I want a relationship with you because you're worthy of my relationship. You know, with, with uh, uh, you, you know, when, when, and, and we use the, the concept of marriage for that. You know, when, when you get married, when we got married, there were certain things that I really was looking for in a wife, you know, um, and they weren't the average thing. I mean, I, you know, at the time I, I, I had a maid clean my house. I didn't need a maid. I wasn't marrying a maid, you know. Um, I didn't need a cook. I was a cook in the army. I could cook my own food, and I did. I, you know, I cooked my own food. I didn't need a cook. So when we got married, that wasn't what I was after, you know. I was after a wife. I was after somebody that loved me. I was after somebody that cared for me. And so I'm, that's the relationship we're sowing to, and that's how it is with God, you see. At the end of the day, it's not just about God blessing your finances. It's not just about him blessing your, your, your it's about him blessing who you are. It's about the relationship with God. I will tell you, that is so much more valuable than the things that God can do for you because he does them out of relationship. When you have the relationship with God and you're sowing to the relationship and you're forwarding the relationship. Now, let's go back to the protocol in the bank that I got, I, I got a relative who dies over here and they've left me some money, but I got a certain protocol to go in the bank. I got to prove who I am. Maybe I gotta fill out a withdrawal slip. Maybe I gotta uh, uh, write a check or, or issues of protocol with the bank. With God, there's a protocol too. But if you have set all the love and the trust issue with God, he'll help you with the protocol. He'll waive the issues of protocol. He'll begin to teach you about protocol and so forth. So the letter of the law is not as important as the love and the trust issue. That's what God's after is the love and the trust. So if, you're, if you want to see your faith grow, work on the love and trust of God. Work on loving God more. Work on trusting God more. I remember that, and this goes back, this Miguel and I were married at the time, but this was probably easily 20 years ago. Might have even been more than that. I realized that I, in, in my private time with God, I realized I didn't love God enough. That was my. That was really my. The conclusion that I reached as I, as I was thinking those things through, is I didn't really love God enough. You know, 
And uh, there were things that I was believing him for, but they were secondary to the love relationship that I wanted to have with God. And uh, so I began to seek God and, and, and sell. I said, God, I, I'm willing to sell. I want to sell. Because I, I know this is how it works. You know, you sow and you reap. And what I want is I want to love you more. I want my love for you to grow. What do I need to sow in order to be able to do that? And the Lord spoke clearly to me about what things I needed to do uh, to do that. And I, I doubt today there's anybody that loves God any more than I do because God answered that prayer. And he, he, he responded to my desire to know him better. He responded to my desire to have my love for him increase. He responded to those things. Well, what I didn't really realize at the time was there was so much more involved in that. All of a sudden, that's the key to prayer. That's the key to answer prayer. That's the key to the relationship. That's the key to finding out if you didn't get a prayer answer, why didn't you get it, you know? And what do I do to get it? It's the key to everything is the love and trust, the covenant, if you will. There's a covenant with God. You have a covenant with God. When we accepted Jesus, we entered into the covenant, but we didn't know what was involved in that covenant. We didn't know all that that covenant had to offer us. There were benefits of that covenant. We had no idea what was really involved in, in that covenant. It's better than you thought it was. It's more complete than you thought it was. There's more to it than you think there is. There's more to it than you'll, we'll never mind the depths of covenant on this earth, you know, because our mind has, we, we have a mind that's, that's, that's it's, it's cloudy. You know, the Bible says we see through a, 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 like, a, like a glass darkly or a mirror, a dark mirror, you know, that we're unable to see. But then we're going to see face to face when we get to heaven. When we get to heaven, we're going to be able to mine the depths of coming. We're going to see all that he intended for us to have that we just can't see right now. But I'll tell you, there's more there than you ever dreamed there was. It's better than you ever dreamed it was. There's more available to you than, than you ever dreamed it was. And I just can't even imagine not living life with that covenant, you know, with, 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 uh, without the ability to draw on that, that uh, covenant. So, faith is the substance of things hoped for, is the evidence of things not seen. But, love and trust of God is the substance of faith. That's how you build your faith. That's how you make it. Now, once you begin to get things in order, when you're beginning to pursue the correct order, then God will begin to teach you about what you sow. In other words, this is something I believe in for. What do I sow for that? How do I sow for that? What is it that I do in order to be able to, 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 to get that? You know, I, there's a, uh, uh, I heard Kenneth Copeland talking about this one time, and he said, you know, he developed a habit of saying to God, give me the words to say over this situation. In other words, what words would I say? If I was going to call forth something, what words would I say? And I thought about that, and, and it makes sense, you know. Uh, what words would I say? And I've done that myself on occasion. I've asked God to speak to me about, what, what, you know, here's a problem I have that i got to solve this problem. What do I say? Give me the words to speak of it. It's a good, it, it's a great, uh, it's, it's a great habit to get into. But it's more important for the relationship, to develop the relationship, you know. And it's not about the words. It's, it's God, this is the situation and I, I, I want to develop the fullness of the answer. And yeah, I, need, I may need words to say, but what do I believe for? How, how, how do I believe this? You know, how can I believe for that? How can I, knowing what I believe for, how then can I call that thing forth? What things do I need to do? And so forth. See, God is, God is bigger than your mind can even conceive. He's more capable than your mind can conceive. He's more capable of doing things that you, you, you can believe. But you gotta get there. And you get there through love and trust. Loving God. The more you love him, the more, the more you trust him. Now, once you get over to the issue of knowing how to use your faith, then it becomes a matter of just using the promise. What's the promise? You know, what's the promise? And uh, I'll give you a simple example. Um, <coughs> the Bible talks about and it doesn't talk about it so much in the New Testament. It's more in the Old Testament. It talks about first fruits. And uh, what is a first fruit? 
you know. Well, in, in, in ancient Israel, what would happen is when they began to take the harvest in, they would grab the first sheaths of the harvest and they would run to the house of the Lord with it and they would present it before the Lord as a wave offering. They would present the, the first of the harvest, the best of the harvest, the best portion. They would present it before God as a, as a first fruits offering. And the idea was to associate God with the rest of the harvest. What they, what they wanted to do was say, you know, what, what it said essentially is this. You are responsible for the harvest. It was you who brought this portion. That's the best portion. I'm returning this portion to you. I'm honoring you with this portion. And as I honor you with that portion, I want you to touch the rest of the harvest too. That's what first fruits is, is, is all about. It's, it's not about the portion you gave to God. It's about what he's going to do with the rest of it. And that's the key to first fruits. And when we began to get a hold of that, it transformed things for us, you know, because it is a spiritual principle that by faith you can adopt and you can plant that spiritual principle in just about anything that you do new for the first time, for the first situation. Um, get the first fruit. So we, but it works by faith. They all work by faith. And so as we began to sow uh, first fruits, we began to reap. And uh, it really works that way with any promise that you have in here. Uh, we had a situation where we were believing God for something. This was a number of years ago. And uh, so I went to the word and I said, okay, God, I'm gonna, I need to find a scripture over this thing. And, uh, and I picked out a scripture over this thing and I began to pray that scripture. And I prayed it every day for two and a half years. Because you see, most people, when you, when, when you believe in God for something, most people pray for two and a half minutes, you know, or maybe, maybe a couple of days, or if it's really important, they'll do it for a couple of weeks. This was two and a half years. And at the end of the two and a half years, God spoke to me in a dream. And he said, okay, I want to change what you're saying. I want to change, your, change what you're speaking. Don't use that scripture anymore. Use this one. Give me, a new, give me something new to begin to say. So I did it. Well, it took two more years. It was two more years of praying that new scripture, but at the end of the four and a half years, it was done. And you know, you forget that it was. It didn't matter that it was four and a half years because it was done. And that's the thing of the. You know, the Bible talks about the pregnant woman. It says, you know, she's in travail, she's in pain until the baby comes. When the baby comes, she forgets all the pain. You know. Well, that's how it is with the promises of God. See, you may have to believe for a while. You may have to stand for a while, but when you get the promise, you forget all about the travail of having to stand. It didn't matter anymore how long you had to stand because you got the promise. And that's the way it is. That's the way it is with, 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 with God. He's able. He's willing. He's capable. Hallelujah. Well, thank you, Jesus. Anyway, when you work on your faith, you're saying to God, it matters. You matter. What you... This is what you said pleases you, I'm pleasing you. It changes the dynamic of your relationship with God for him to see that you seek him, for him to see that you are chasing him. It changes the dynamic of him. Anyway, praise the Lord. Well, hallelujah, that's enough for today. Anyway, hopefully that just whetted your appetite and began to build your... Uh, Can I share something? Of course, of course. When we, went, when we went through the season where we had no money... We had no finances. We had no cash. The Lord spoke to us to go next door, and that place was Sarasota. And so when we went there, we thought, well, I had Deuteronomy 6, that he was going to give me a goodly city that I didn't build and give me a goodly house that I didn't build and give me filled with goodly things that I didn't fill. Is from Deuteronomy 6. I had that passage. I knew that passage. And so when we went to Sarasota, though, we were thinking that we were going to purchase a home there because it, whenever God would send us to a place, we would think that we were going to buy a, buy a place. And so we looked at house after house after house, a place that we could abide in, that we could live because God had sent us there. And... Um, so I was writing down 
um, that I, I had a prayer request of that I wanted a c certain things there. I wanted it to be turnkey. I wanted it to uh, be in a, a certain place that I could view the area and pray over the area. And um, so we were thinking, you know, in our minds that we were going to buy something. So we're looking at all these large million dollar plus places with no money. <laughs> we didn't have any money to buy. And um, so they showed us this penthouse there. And, um, you know, we, we didn't have any money to buy it. So uh, we're out praying one day uh, in Sarasota. And um, I said to Kevin, I said, you know, we need to, I feel like we need to call that realtor and see if we can, you know, stay in that place. And so the Lord provided, and that place was turnkey. It was a home, but it was a penthouse, amen. It had all the things and more that I was asking for, but we didn't have to buy it, amen, because we didn't, were only temporarily going to be there, but we lived in it like we owned it for a year, amen. And so sometimes God, in, in those things that you're believing for, he's given you the scripture for, you kind of might think it's last season, and I'm going to do it the way I did it last season, but God in that season had for us just to dwell there temporarily. We were going to be, he was going to be sending us back here. Amen. And so, but where is your faith? Is there faith in what your next season is? Are you attaching faith or is it just, I'm working on somebody else's faith or I'm just, it sounds like a good place to go. God wants to be, he wants you to, to have faith in him that he has that place for you and that he's going to provide the next place instead of your own ability, right? At that point, we had no capacity to buy it. We had to buy it with our faith, amen? And God met us. And so wherever you are in your new season and what you're growing in, where is it? Are you, is your faith attached to it? Or are you, are you believing for the supernatural? Or are you just believing by how you can do it, amen? Let's, uh, we're going to bring our tithes here this morning. I had my check here. I brought it right here. Sign, Hallelujah. Sign, yeah. The Bible says in Malachi, this is the time we get to give and receive. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, that you said bring all the tithes into the storehouse. And prove me now if I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive. And Lord, we thank you. We run. Run to bring you the tithe, Lord. We celebrate you. We are so thankful for so many ways that you have proven yourself, that you have rebuked the devourer over our family, over our finances, over our lives, Lord. We thank you. You have been our, have rebuked the devourer for our sakes. And we thank you, Lord, that you have performed every promise that you have associated with the tithe in our lives. And we thank you, Lord, and we run, we rush joyfully to bring our tithes and offerings to you today. We thank you for blessing everyone that is with us today. We thank you, Father, for we receive this word of faith this morning, and we're provoking ourselves to a newer, a greater place of trust in you, Jesus. I thank you for all that you're doing in the lives of those people that listen by the way of the internet, Lord. And Father, we believe you and we are, we're pressing on for new things that you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us. God bless you. And uh, so we'll, uh, tomorrow morning, is it tomorrow? It's tomorrow. The, uh, so tomorrow morning is the uh, prayer saturation. So it starts at five in the morning. Uh, you can join us on the prayer line there or uh, by uh, later on about 1030. Uh, we... Uh, uh, online, online uh, around 10 30 or so so thank you so much for joining us it's a privilege to have you join us you know we, we recognize you have a lot of places you could go we have recognized that you have a lot of things you you you, you do and uh, that you don't have you got other ways to spend your time we appreciate you joining us online and thank you so much and god bless you and those of you that are here thank you we appreciate your time we appreciate you you guys being here it's a real privilege to be able to to minister the word. And thank you so much for joining us. God bless you. And hallelujah. Jesus.